Hi, colleagues. This is John Fischetti. Welcome to episode 27 of We Will Get Through This, Transformative Leadership for Disruptive Times. And I'm here with my colleague and great co-host, Scott Emig. Scott, how are you today? Hey, John. I'm doing well. It's really nice to see you. I know we haven't done one of these in about a week, and I'm glad we are getting back to it. Yeah, it's good to see you as well. Scott, the world has uh, changed and not necessarily for the better in the COVID area. South, South America, North America, Europe's bouncing back. Africa is probably on fire in many respects uh, with uh, the testing now beginning to know what's happening there. And here in Australia, we have a bounce back in Victoria with increased cases now at 500 a day. And in New South Wales, just a little bit people worried. And I wondered if we could spend today's episode with you helping guide us in this reality that means we'll be in and out of worrying and wondering in school or not, online or not. I know from my own uh, kids teaching in North America, they're starting the year back in online, uh, te uh, you know, teaching and learning in home environments, but then they'll be back at school at some point. Everybody's like just worried. Mm -hmm. How do you guide your staff as a leader, head teacher, a deputy, a principal, or other kind of, dignitary in this administrative mm -hmm. process to 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 be okay as much as we can be in at this time because we're weeks and months if not even a year from the other side of this and we just got to keep going and we got to maintain our positivity but it's really hard when there's setbacks and all that unknown um, how would you suggest we begin to frame our leadership style and technique that's it it's a great question. It's quite a challenge now, isn't it? As this thing really continues to drag and it, you're right. It's this, it's this, this positivity that, that, that we felt early on as people were making the best of this, we're, we're getting to a point now where it is wearing people down. And, you know, I, I, I think a big piece that we've talked about, and I think a big piece we need to keep in the room is this notion of you know, knowing yourself, and knowing the people with whom you work. And there is this, um, this, this tremendous underpinning of coaching in the, in the world of coaching, the world of cognitive coaching that I, that I spend a lot of time in. It's that you, you really are not an effective leader unless you understand what you bring to the game, unless you understand your own perspective on things, um, unless you've worked through it and really helped to unpack your thinking. But but it's not just about yourself. It's also about really trying to empathize. Empathy is at the heart of so much of what we do as good leaders. And, you know, I think, I think as leaders, a lot of times we get caught up in trying to either protect people or convey information, um, you know, which sometimes comes across as a bit harsh. And I think it's this ideal blend of empathy and information that is perhaps the, the mark of the really truly talented leader. So, so how do we do this? Um, I, think, I think it's everybody who's out there who's listening right now, I think you, you know your people, but you also know your people day to day. You don't know how they're dealing in this situation. So communication is incredibly important. It's, it's those things that we continue to stress about reaching out to your team you know, checking in on them, uh, making the small talk, having the little gestures of, you know, just checking up on, on how you're doing. How's your, how's your son doing? I, oh, I know you said your wife was sick. How are things? Um, it's, it's making those connections and building that rapport and really getting, um, getting inside the world of your, of your team, not just, you know, as it relates to you know, the day-to-day -day, um, components of your, of your work but as it relates to them as human beings. So how do you start doing that with teachers who have to now go back to the well and create new content online? We have some systems in place now, whether it's Seesaw or Canvas or whatever tool you're using out there and people less worried about it all. But on one end, we have young people probably much more hesitant because they've been looking forward to going to school. Mm -hmm. On the other end, you have um, teachers who may have run out of ideas. Um, how do you supervise that if a teacher's like pedagogy is just watch it on YouTube and write something about it? Because we have some of those issues out there, particularly for those schools that may have had to, to jerk back to an online situation without a lot of preparation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you're putting forward there is a really good coaching problem because, 
you know, as as a school leader, as an organizational leader, you whether they're your teachers are in your building doing it or they're or they're phoning it in on Zoom. Um, I guess, you know, that's a mixed metaphor there, but if they're phoning it in on Zoom, that, you know, quite honestly, um, you have the exact same issues that you do as a leader in that, you know, to effectively change someone's practice, you have to, first of all, get them to really think and reflect on their practice. So, um, you know, the, the challenge would be for for leaders who are seeing their, um, their staff members um, engaging in practices that you honestly believe are not as effective as they can be. Um, you need you need to put them in a situation where you you engage in conversations with them about why they're why they're engaging in certain practices. Um, what are the intentions of that lesson? Have they thought about other ways that they might be able to convey that information? You know, just simply having a student. There's there's not necessarily anything wrong with watching YouTube videos, but I think watching YouTube videos and making that the sum of your, your lesson, there's, there, there is a problem there. So it becomes a conversation with, with your teachers about, um, you know, talk to me about why you chose this. What are you hoping your students get out of this? Um, talk to me about how you'll know if they get that out of it. What is it that will tell you that they've, they've actually taken what you've provided and, and managed to, you know, use it to inform their thinking, to change their own, to get them to reflect on it. Um, I think one of the things that we don't do enough of is we don't, we don't spend really enough time reflecting on our own practice. And that's the greatest thing that we can do for our colleagues is providing them with a safe format where we ask them just a series of probing questions to get them to really, it, having to articulate why you do something makes you in many, many cases question why you're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Think about it here in New South Wales, we have pockets of COVID emerging in different schools on a different day. So we've just had school on Thursday. Now we don't have it Friday. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to be back Monday after a deep clean. And in the messaging of that, and you've seen some of it just working where we work and know from colleagues who have shared some things, how can you as a leader provide that empathy as well for the difficulty it is to not actually know what's next? Because in this thing we've we've become used to but don't like that we don't know where this is going mm -hmm. and for teachers who put themselves on the front line every day this is real um, so how would you re recommend not just throwing in the towel of of whatever to mm -hmm. really still keeping the the really engaging pedagogy the really caring classrooms going regardless of the format that we're in when we're a little bit of chaos right now yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. Um, it is chaos, and and you're right. If you if you're teaching face to face one day, and then the next day you're home, and the following Monday you're back to school, and you never quite know, um, it is easy to throw in the towel. But but I think that's why I think people go into teaching because they're special people. I think people go into administration because they're they're special people. If they'd wanted something easy, they could have chosen a different profession. Um, the thing that makes teaching, I think so attractive to people who are innovative and dynamic and creative is the fact that every day you have that, you have that opportunity to, you know, to really change some lives, to really make a difference. And so for me, I think it's also helping your team remember, remember why, why are you doing this? What is it about this? And, and also helping, you know, you can, you can do your best to, to empathize with them. And by doing that, um, you're also providing a model for them, encouraging them to model and empathize with their own students. Because, um, you know, for a teacher who may have lost his or her mojo, I don't think anything's more more empowering and more kind of stop you in your tracks and turn your you know turn this around than than realizing the the effects of what you're doing on the students with whom you're working. Yeah, definitely. If in the situations where school is staying online for the foreseeable future, like in most of the US right now. Yeah. Um, what do you recommend for teachers who are in supervisory roles, like department heads, team leaders, assistant principal types, uh, when they have to make those, have those tough conversations with people who certainly they've done the caring things, but now it's time to actually have a conversation that is not going well. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Um, you know, and that is one of those things too that, that that you have to be able to shift from being 
uh, you know, a, a coach to uh, and collaborative, you have to be able to shift from that to being more directive. And it's it's hard, but in order to do it, I think you you don't make it about um, you never make it about the person. You know, my 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 approach to this is you always make it about it's not about me fixing you. Um, it's really about you and I improving what's happening here for the students who, who matter. Um, so look, we're a team and this is going to change. You know, what's happening here, this can't be business as usual because you and I both understand that, you know, these students over here deserve better. So we're going to work together. We're going to work together to do what we have to do to provide them with the kind of education they deserve. So I think a big piece is right off the bat, making it clear that, that you're a team, you're in it together. It's not about you fixing that person. It's not about you telling them that they have a, um, that they have a um, deficiency. I think, you know, they're going to, ha there'll be lots of time for self-reflection. I'm on the heels of your conversation and I think it will occur, but I don't think anything um, is more empowering um, than, than realizing that, you know, the, you have the control, you can shift what you're, you're doing. Um, and sometimes you just need somebody to point it out to you that what's going is not, what's going on is not working. What would you say to someone in our neck of the woods who would say, you know, 2020, we're just going to chuck it. Let's uh, mail in and just do the worksheets the rest of the year because there's nothing, we can't do anything about it. A staff member who's just really reached that tipping point of not able to handle the potential that we're going backwards with whatever we're calling this, a second wave or a little blip in the screen. How do we help them reframe themselves mm -hmm. to be back on really being as brilliant and uh, as who they are, but COVID kind of has gotten in their way? Um. You know what, I, I think, so this is where we have to recognize these are unusual times. And, you know, these, the person who's thrown in the towel and is saying, look, I'm phoning it in, um, they didn't get there easily. It was a journey to get there. And it was, it was a hard journey and lots of, you know, this has been challenging. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, the challenges that people are experiencing at work is sometimes magnified at home. So you, you don't know everything that's happening. Um, and you always just have to assume when you work with somebody that they're dealing with a lot. Um, so in terms of, in terms of helping them turn it around, I think the first thing you need to do is you need to reach out, you need to listen, you know, see if you can, see if you can understand why they've reached this point. And then, you know, again, it's, it's bringing it back to the students. And if that doesn't work, then you slide from being collaborative to more directive. And you say, you know what, we are going to change this. And this is what we're going to do. And it, in many cases, it's, it's aligning them with, with the team. It's putting them together with a small group of teachers who, who haven't lost their mojo and saying, you know what, I think the three of you are going to, I think I'd love for the three of you to spend some time over the next month and like you to check in with each other a couple times a week. And I'd like you very much to spend time coaching each other, asking each other really good questions about the practice, what you're doing, why you're doing it, what you hope to, the outcomes of those things are. Because simply getting professionals engaged in professional conversations elevates their game. Yeah, that's fantastic, Scott. I really appreciate that insight. A couple of other things we talked about a few weeks ago might come back to us as well, and that is to help people remind ourselves what we needed to know in April. And that is, number one, you're not responsible for this. You didn't create mm -hmm. this. And number two, don't try to expect the same things out of teaching and learning. So if you're in a school where Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you have your kids face to face and Tuesday, Thursday, they're online and you're supposed to teach some other kids. And you know, we have primary teachers doing these hodgepots of things all around the world. If you can, don't own the responsibility. This is clunky. This is not perfect. And to maximize every moment you had, can, that helping kids gain a little bit of knowledge, but also that they're okay, that they'll be fine. We're not behind anything. This is a good year. It's just a different year and we're learning a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And promoting this notion of self-regulation, which is that kids take charge of their own learning, is a pretty impressive thing. If that's what we got out of 2020, they'll be great till 2060 or so when they need something else. So <laughs> I think trying to make sure we don't forget what we knew a few months ago, because it, it seems as if the tide just came out and just washed our brains that, that we're back to square one. No, we've learned a lot. Uh, and the moral leaders that teachers are remember that uh, the inspiration they provide is most of what kids get from them anyway, the kind of people that teachers are. Scott, I wonder if we could finish today with a thought about, so what do we do with these ideas? How do we 
take these forward to some actions? Well, I'm going to I'm going to throw out a challenge that's going to require our audience to to do a bit of reflection about how they take their big ideas and actually implement them. So, I I think you know many people out there would say, look, I I go out of my way to build communities, I, to build a school that's built on an ethic of care, or I have a school that's built around respect, or trust is hugely important in my building. Um, you know, and, and those are all incredibly important values. But what I think I'd challenge our listeners to do is, so break that down. What does it look like? How do you actually do it? How do you build that community of care? What are the steps that you take? And again, this is that same thing that I was just talking about with, with teachers. If you can get them reflecting on their practice about what they believe and why and how they do it, I think you, you elevate their practice. So let's let's have our leaders try that. Look at look at one of the one of the tenets that undergirds your school, and see if you can articulate in a you know a couple bullet points about where do you do it, where are the places that you make it happen. Yeah, that'd be really good, and I hope our listeners can take that on board and do something with it. I want to just add at a more micro level, not as important as that, that I'd love our leaders to check any communication before they push send, uh, because of how, you know, Scott, when email was first invented and was circulated into higher education, it became this way in which people were trying to read messages between, right? It's got to decode the tone. If I send a note, Scott, see me, you might say, oh, I wonder what's wrong or what have I done or what's up with John as opposed to, hi, Scott, hope you're having a good day. If you get a chance, give me a call a little later. Yes. Well, nothing urgent. Now, I know that took me four extra seconds to say and three extra seconds to type, Go ahead and take that extra mile. Leave people comforted in the exchange. The worst thing we can do now is to make people more worried because there's a lot of new information that's coming at us. It's disconcerting. We're not really programmed for it in our, in our primal brains. And we want to know at least our leaders are going okay so we can say, oh, I'd like to be like Scott. He seems to be okay. And to check any tone, which is never really intended but can be misread, that it's finishing with a positive tone. We use we will get through this, but at mm -hmm. the end of every lawn, I really look forward to seeing you next week. Or don't leave those little bits and pieces out as if we were in a face-to-face -face meeting, because without those, people are only left with the words they have, and they're gonna fill in the gaps, because you're working with smart people who are all gonna micromanage it. And the other component is to look for arbitrariness in anything. We have a colleague who told a student who was looking to do something the other day, just no, as opposed to, I'll be right back to you, I just have to check a couple things out, because they were actually trying to tell a student no on something that was easy to say yes, because the student wasn't trying to pull the wool over. So if we have kids in an online situation or unable to come to school now because their parent might be sick or their grandmother they live with, they don't want to bring potential risk to them, let's not assume guilty. We know some kids will be gaming the system, but they would have been gaming it sitting right in front of you. Let's assume that everybody's trying to get through this with us. And if they can take that lesson, that assignment, that idea, and turn it into something on their terms, that's fine. It doesn't have to go the way in which we might have envisioned it. Because what we really need to do is continue to focus on learning and optimism that when we get to the other side of this, we'll be better as a result of it, not worse off. So that may be a little bit tricky, but don't push send on mm -hmm. an email until you've reread it and said, does it have in it that kind of leader you were just speaking of? And does it have that care and empathy and compassion? And when you have to make a tough call, I wouldn't do it on email. You're going to have to do it face-to-face, -face, even if that face-to-face -face is what we're doing today. Uh, because nobody should receive a news like I know of a, of a colleague who was sacked through an email. They didn't, the, their boss didn't even have the pleasure of doing it via a Zoom. So let's just do the things that keep people, uh, the human side of things, the humanness of things. And I think at least you can go to bed every night and try to get up the next day and see how crazy it's gotten today. Yeah. No, I think that's wonderful. I, I, I really, I think that advice is, you know, spending a few extra seconds before you hit send, you know, easy and important. And boy, the, the rewards of that go a long way with your team. Absolutely. Scott, thanks for your words of wisdom today. It's a pleasure as always, and look forward to seeing you next time. I enjoyed it. I'll, uh, I'll see you next week. Yep. This has been episode 27 of We Will Get Through This, and we look forward to seeing you in our next episode. Folks, thanks for listening and watching today. Bye-bye.